Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Tong, Baroness Tong, independent Liberal Democrat. I've been in the House of Lords since 2005, and I chair the all-party group on population development and reproductive health. And just to advertise my group a little bit, um, we did, two years ago, publish this paper um, after hearings and extensive research called Childhood Lost. And let me tell you that that particular photograph at the bottom, if you look at it, has gone all around the world. It is really quite, quite harrowing if you look at it. Um, this very, very, very young girl who's been hitched to this rather fierce and elderly man. Um, but it happens all over, and it happens in this country too. Um, that <coughs> child marriage is still taking place, we know, and we're doing lots in government. And I may say that even though I'm an independent Liberal Democrat, the coalition government and the Conservative government now have been really, really good on these issues, and they still are very, very strong on women's issues, and we do thank them for that. Now, I warn you there's going to be a vote um, and Baroness Verma will have to go. <coughs> um, I have also, I also warn you, I'm recovering from whooping cough. I'm not infectious anymore. <laughs> but if I get a fit of coughing, I may have to retire hurt for a while. <laughs> but I hope I don't. Um, Baroness Verma is going to speak first. And if she's called away to vote, I shall carry on reading her speech for us so we can get some continuity. OK? Everyone happy about that? I'll introduce people as we go along. <coughs> Baroness Verma was appointed Parliamentary Under Secretary of State of the Department, here we go, <coughs> of International Development in 2015, just after the election. She had a long career in business before that, and I didn't know she'd been involved in fashion industry from the age of nine. And <laughs> then went <laughs> changed her business to the service sector and ended up in Chogham Task Force, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and made her way eventually to being raised to the peerage in 2006, where she's now Baroness Burma of Leicester in the county of Leicestershire, if you didn't know, and your opposition whip and under Secretary of State and spokesperson for Cabinet Office International Development of Women and Equalities, Business, Innovation and Skills. But now, She's our Minister for International Development, and we're going to hear from you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can, um, if I just stay seated, or do you want me to stand? Yeah. Well, I'd rather people stood up, actually. Oh, yeah. I think it's better to do the lungs. <laughs> better do all the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much um, for that introduction, Jenny, and uh, Baroness Tong. And, and I think... Um, Given that we may have a vote, I'm going to try and get through the speech, well, as much of the speech as I can, because I don't want to tax Baroness Tong too much with her, her disability of her chest today. Um, but um, I also want to thank um, the Girls Not Brides UK and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for inviting me to come and speak to, to you all today. And, and I was hoping that um, the fellow parliamentarians would also have made it, but I think they're running a bit late. So they'll sort of join us for um, the, the Q&A uh, later on. Um, for me, this event is quite timely um, because I was in Bangladesh last week, and um, just a couple of weeks before that I was in Malta at the first ever Commonwealth Heads of Government's Women's Forum. Um, while there, I was delighted to have participated in a workshop on ending child, um, early and forced marriage, and to see that the final Commonwealth Heads of State communicate child marriage was recognised as a key issue on which the Commonwealth should focus. Um, this was, of course, at the same time as the African leaders were meeting at their first ever African Girls Summit in Lusaka, where DFID was also represented. Colleagues have reported how fantastic it was to see participants come together from all over the region, supporting the African Union's campaign on ending child marriage and making a strong commitment to supporting the rights of girls across Africa. The African Union's campaign has helped to catalyse action across the continent, and it would be interesting to hear more about um, regional work to end child marriage happening across South Asia, including through the South Asian Initiative to end violence against children. 
It is incredible to think that this is all happening just after, just over a year since the Girls' Summit um, in 2014, which we held in London. And at the time, the UK government was <coughs> to focus on two issues previously <coughs> neglected by the international community, um, female genital mutilation and child early and forced marriage. And now we have leaders from all over the world coming together in international fora and committing to ending these harmful practices. It was at the Girls' Summit 2014 that the UK government announced its £25 million contribution toward the, joint UN, uh, the UN joint programme addressing child marriage in 12 countries around the world, including several countries within the Commonwealth. Um, this is part of our £36 million programme to accelerate action to end child marriage. And today I'd like to talk a little bit more about our DFID's approach within this important programme. I want to start by saying that at DFID we recognise that child marriage is primarily a manifestation of gender inequality, reflecting social norms that perpetuate discrimination against and undermine the value of girls. Girls who marry are not only denied their childhood, they're often socially isolated with limited opportunities from edu education, uh, for education and employment. From this understanding, we have worked with others, including girls, not brides, to develop a global theory of change. This theory of change has <coughs> shaped the international movement to end child marriage and also shaped our, program, our programming. For DFID, it means working across four complex and major areas. The first area is to empower girls and women by increasing their voice, choice and control. And this can be through mentoring girls, providing them with access to safe places, spaces and social networks, as well as financial support to keep girls in school and reduce, eco and reduce eco economic incentives to marry early. Support to community organisations, including women's rights organisations and youth groups, also provide platforms for collective action thereby enhancing voice and agency with respect to sexual and reproductive choices, including within marriage. The second area is shifting harmful attitudes and behaviours, which perpetuate child, early and forced marriage. In order to challenge attitudes and behaviours uh, that perpetuate discrimination against girls, it is important to, su to support social change through whole communities and faith groups. Traditional leaders, diaspora, media, communications champions and communities based um, civil society. And the third area is ensuring access to services. Ending child marriage requires investment in basic services, including quality education, social protection and birth registration systems. Accurate data on girls' age can also support law enforcement and stop child marriages going ahead. It's also important to ensure sexual and reproductive health services are accessible by adolescent girls, married and unmarried. And the fourth and final area is implementing laws and policies to end child early and forced marriage. <coughs> Having the right laws and policies in place is an important element in tackling child early and forced marriage, but it needs to be accompanied by better enforcement of laws, which may entail training of the police, the judiciary, and child protection services. And as the toolkit which will be presented today sets out, there is no one activity, uh, but rather a combination of, four, of these four areas which can work to shift the harmful norms underpinning child early and forced marriage. We need to reach out to different groups from within societies to support change across the four areas. And at DFID we are clear that supporting civil society groups is vital. And that is why as part of our commitment to ending child marriage, we are supporting Amplified Change, a society, civil society fund working to support grassroots organisations working on sexual and reproductive health and rights around the world, thereby addressing many of the causes and consequences of child marriage. Involvement in civil society yields multiple dividends. Civil society can ensure the engagement of young people including those directly affected by child marriage. They can encourage greater levels of ambition and help to ensure that the full range of barriers um, are addressed. Civil society can move easily to reach out to those important actors 
such as community leaders, who we know play a vital role in ending the practice. They are also, can also importantly hold governments and international communities to account. Another important and equally diverse group which is at the heart of DFID's work on child marriage is youth. As a priority, this means involving those girls at risk and directly impacted by child marriage, putting them at the centre of decision making and programmes. We must hear the voices of girls, particularly of marginalised girls, of the poorest girls, of those girls who are already married. But we, we, we must also listen to the voices of wider youth groups and networks, including boys, to highlight what addressing gender inequality means to them. And this is why, alongside the Girls' Summit, Youth for Change was launched in 2014, bringing together a youth-led coalition of young activists to advocate for girls' rights, including FGM and child and early forced marriage. Since then, they have been doing important work on these issues at home and internationally. They were critical to the delivery of the September 2015 Youth Summit, which brought, some young, which brought young people into DFID ahead of the UN General Assembly to discuss what matters most to them within international development. Wider communities, including traditional and religious leaders, business and the private sector, are also key actors for bringing about the change to social norms, to harmful social norms. And last, but by <coughs> no means least, a group which are committed to change are of course parliamentarians. And I'm delighted that we will have today politicians from around the world as advocates within our own respective governments to discuss this important issue. After all, parliamentarians have the opportunity and voice many of these groups that I've mentioned do not. Parliamentarians can initiate legislation to support an end to child marriage and bring this through a parliamentary process. We also have the opportunity to advocate with our colleagues to, in ministries across government to incorporate policies and activities across the four areas to address child, early and forced marriage. It could mean advocating with the Treasury to allocate a budget for these activities or having discussions with health, education and social care ministers to provide supportive services for girls at risk and along with them married girls. And through our unique position within government, we can do what parliamentarians around the world seek to do every day, give space and encouragement to some of the voices of those other groups, voices which often go unheard. I began by speaking about the African Girls' Summit and the first Girls' Summit here in London in 2014. The Girls' Summit 2014 was a moment of transformative political leadership on the issues of FGM and child and early and forced marriage not only from the UK, but from governments around the world. September 2015 saw another movement of powerful political leadership for supporting gender equality, the agreement of the global goals in New York. And today we recognise the potential of parliamentarians to be powerful advocates for change, for better futures for girls within the Commonwealth and around the world. And as all of us with voices and influence, we must use our positions to make sure that the targets within the global goal framework supporting the rights of girls and women, including target 5.3 on eliminating harmful practices <coughs> such as FGM and child early <coughs> marriage, are translated into national action. And in doing so, that other groups that I have identified are engaged in this process. I, for one, am passionately committed to making this happen. But we can only make lasting change if we join forces across countries and contexts, across different faith groups, across governments and across civil society to make this transformative movement for better futures for girls everywhere. We have, a, we have some real good opportunities to work together and it is time, I think, for us to be more ambitious and even more brave for change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that gives you a sort of overview of, the of what we're trying to do in this country. But oh dear, good job. And um, we depend hugely, of course, 
on the support of the NGOs and the hard work of the NGOs in this country and worldwide. And so our next speaker is going to be Tanya Barron, who started out as a special needs teacher, which is nice to know, and then a lecturer in politics and philosophy, joined BSO, became head of programmes for Eastern Europe, and after three years with the European Ch Children's Trust in 1999, she was appointed the first CEO of Home Start International, who also know very well. Um, seconded to Brussels to manage a grant-making facility for the European Commission, and until 2002, she was chair of UNICEF NGO Committee for CEEC stroke CIS in Geneva, in translation. Um, she was appointed as international director at the Leonard Cheshire Disability in 2004 and has co-authored various papers and edited two LCD books, Disability and Inclusive Development in Poverty and Disability. She became chief executive of Plan UK in January 2013, and that she still is, and holds various trusteeships and is currently a board member of the World Bank's Global Partnership. And I think almost most important of all, in 2003, she was given the European Women's Achievement Humanitarian Award. Congratulations on that, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I hand you Baron? I would prefer it. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. No, I agree. It's better for the lungs, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Project. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you, everybody, for this lovely opportunity um, to actually talk to you about some of the very important and quite practical matters that are um, really laid out in this booklet, toolkit, as to how um, parliamentarians can really play an incredibly and increasingly important part in this real battle to end child marriage. Um, and I also want to thank the Baroness Werner for a great speech. Thank you. Um, and it's really great to be reminded of the role uh, that I believe uh, the very strong role that uh, the UK has shown in their commitment in tackling uh, child and early forced marriage. <coughs> Practical, um, as well as uh, part of a very passionate and important campaign. And the practical bit is there is actually now this wonderful toolkit um, that I feel actually we should all be very proud of because it it's a simple and practical approach to something that has really come from an enormous amount of thought and understanding of theories of change um, and a really big collective development push on this absolutely single critical issue of ending child marriage. And I was just thanking Baroness Verma for a, 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 a rousing speech which just reminded me again of how the UK has consistently um, kept this issue on the table and kept pushing it sort of up the agenda. And I, and I, I feel that that's been uh, very important for all of us. Um, so it's wonderful to have the opportunity to address MPs and parliamentarians from so many different countries um, to present some of these recommendations and I hope also to have a chance to hear about some of the work that you're doing um, in all the many different countries represented in this room around the world towards ending child marriage. As part of Plan UK, um, I'm really pleased that we were able to co-chair the Girls Not Brides UK partnership 
And we do that uh, alongside Forward UK, uh, another really fantastic organisation that's worked tirelessly on many of these issues. Um, the UK Partnerships began in 2012, and it's made up primarily of UK civil society organisations. Um, and we work together to end child marriage, and it's as simple as that, if only it was as simple as that. Um, and we work closely with government, and we share between us, and I think it's a much more mutual, two-way sharing, and more of that in a minute, uh, to share knowledge and learning and evidence to ensure that our work is as effective as possible. Uh, the membership is very varied, um, and some of the members work very much in the UK, uh, for example, the Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization, uh, very much working in the UK, uh, whereas other members, partners like Plan and World Vision uh, tend to focus mostly uh, globally. Um, and I'm also delighted to say that now I believe uh, membership of Girls Not Brides is over 500 mm -hmm. members globally. That is an extraordinary achievement because it, you know, it hasn't taken that long. It's really lit a fire under people. Um, and that's in over 80 countries. Um, um, one of the examples for us, and again, this is a very practical way, is that the plan international offices in many of the countries can actually support, engage in plan advocacy. Um, and I know that um, as examples for some of you in the room, uh, we work very closely with our colleagues in Bangladesh and Pakistan um, to really try and find the best ways forward on these sometimes quite difficult issues. Um, now, I'd like to just use the toolkit, the parliamentarian's toolkit, as a bit of a framework, just to trot through some of it, uh, not reading it out, that would be very boring, I think we've all got a copy of it. Um, but it's a great resource to help your work with government and civil society, whether it's in the Maldives, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Pakistan, um, to help end child marriage. And, Really, as parliamentarians, we do believe you are absolutely the key actors. Not the only actors, but terrifically important. And clearly, in taking the lead on legislation, on allocating resources, on monitoring and implementation, and actually also, and this is often a hard bit, guaranteeing accountability from your own governments. So in here, you'll see this, this, the second um, section, is about child marriage, the definition and global prevalence. And we already heard from Baroness Verma uh, some of the facts and figures. 15 million girls married every year. That's around 41,000 every day. Uh, in South Asia, I have to say, a shocking 45% of girls under 18 are married as children. Uh, section 3 in this toolkit talks about the drivers and also the impact of child marriage. Now, I mean, I think we all know that the, 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 the drivers, uh, the causes, are complex. Um, and they also depend somewhat from place to place. But they certainly include gender inequality, poverty, concerns about security and protection of girls, lack of education, distance to schools, cultural traditions. Um, and often, and almost always, I would say a complex mix of, all, of many of those things. Um, and obviously, child marriage is, should be an absolutely critical area of interest for parliamentarians, because it's such a fundamental violation of human rights. It undermines all other efforts for gender equality, women and girls empowerment, and it very clearly, and we have now a massive evidence, this is no longer in doubt, uh, a real impact on health, education, well-being, and it, it does matter on, on national productivity. Um, it certainly massively undermines children's rights, and especially girls' rights, to education, causing girls to drop out of school. Uh, married girls, in some places, are legally excluded from education, so even where there are good but innovative projects to get married girls returning into school. In some countries, that's spectacularly difficult um, with even structural uh, legal barriers uh, to uh, enabling that to happen. 
Um, and girls excluded <coughs> from education um, have little chance to restructure the power imbalances um, that really result in such entrenched gender inequality. And if girls have little say about their marriages, uh, you can't expect that they have much to say about all and any other decisions that affect their lives. It's certainly detrimental to girls' health, and that's probably one of the more sort of obviously devastating impacts of child marriage. Um, it's extraordinary, really. The complications in childbirth and pregnancy are the leading cause of death of girls aged 15 to 19 in low and even middle income countries. And that's something which we actually just shouldn't tolerate. <coughs> that should be completely unacceptable. Um, we also know um, that there's a really worrying correlation between girls who are married uh, under the age of 18 are much, much more likely to experience domestic abuse and report that their first sexual encounter was forced. Mm. Um, <coughs> child marriage is, to a large extent, it is tied to poverty. Girls from poor families are twice as likely to marry before they're 18 as girls from wealthier families. But that isn't the only issue. So section four of the toolkit um, talks about child marriage and law. And you might think as parliamentarians that's absolutely the bit that you're going to be most interested in. Um, now actually in many countries, uh, the legal age of marriage is not the problem. It's that actually that is contradicted by customary law and weak or non-existent legislative frameworks to protect girls from child marriage. And as parliamentarians, uh, we do believe that one of the things that you really can take action on, and dare I say it should take action on, um, is that if in your country the legal age of marriage is not 18 for girls and boys, that is something very practical and concrete. And I say that in full recognition of the state of the law in the UK. Um, also as parliamentarians, um, if there are weak birth registration systems, that is something also importantly connected. Um, very often girls are unable to prove, or people working alongside them, are unable to help them prove that they are indeed too young to marry. So birth registration is, is one of the sort of important tangential things that actually, as parliamentarians, you could really work on. Um, and also, of course, if the legal age of marriage, as I mentioned before, is simply contradicted by customary or religious laws or practices, that again is a, it's a complicated area to work in, but it's something which as parliamentarians um, and courageous parliamentarians, uh, it's an area which is important to work in. And of course, ratification of international <coughs> legal instruments um, is important, but not enough. Enforcement is the key, and you know, as we found in this country, on issues like FGM, <coughs> um, legislation is one of them. <coughs> Finding routes through to enforcement that, that work, that are effective, is another. Um, so section five of this says talks about the role of members of parliament in ending child marriage again, and perhaps the most obvious one is to help develop policies and legislation to prevent child marriage, but also to ensure implementation. You know, what are the associated regulations that are needed, and what is the methodology in your country to ensure that that is happening? Certainly harmonising international law, or domesticating international law to national law. Um, calling on your governments to really work hard to develop a national action plan on child marriage. Um, interesting to know whether you have, you know, which of our countries has a national action plan on child marriage. And then absolutely critically, and we know because those of us who have been involved in the financing of the SDGs understand that the financing um, of efforts to end child marriage, uh, for example, funding national action plans in their development, funding social services to do the sorts of follow-up, you know, to fund a mechanism in a country that actually enables people to monitor um, progress. So, and in the final chapter, it again, it says, so what can parliamentarians do? Um, 
we think that actually one of the issues which I've just mentioned, to have a really transformative impact on policy as MPs, that ensuring the financing in budget discussions is, again, it's a practical, not easy, but way forward. Um, ensuring the legal age of marriage laws are implemented. Ensuring that community-based outreach to raise awareness of the law and funding to train the justice system. Training to, for the police. Um, all the sorts of bits of your structure, bits of your national infrastructure where you might find support for laws that you are going to help to push through. Um, it's also important to support other areas of life where legislation can come in and financing can support it to actually provide a much better environment, um, an environment where girls can achieve their full potential. Um, and although, you know, I think the SDGs um, are an important guide here because they show us that we've got to treat so many aspects of, of development and, and the change we want as interdependent. So working on ending child marriage really is the other side of the coin, I think, to keeping girls in school. So ensuring that the work isn't in a sort of linear monoculture, but actually we're, we're understanding what are all the different aspects that parliamentarians could have a big impact on in ensuring that we all understand the relationship between staying in school, staying out of marriage, having the right social services to monitor and implement. Um, and, and as I said, the really difficult bit, I think, you can also, as parliamentarians, demand accountability from the government, um, in particular by questioning those who are responsible for ending child marriage on you know, making it really public, what is the prevalence and really public what actions are being taken. Finding out if your country has domesticated legislation on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I think all of those things are things that are difficult, and in different countries there are different barriers uh, to enabling that to happen easily. Um, I think, um, as also um, Baron has been said, Working with civil society is really important. But one of the things I think is very interesting, and it certainly happened in the UK, and I don't know if it's happened in your countries. Uh, we can perhaps hear about that in a minute. But when I started working in development, an embarrassingly long time ago, nearly 30 years ago, um, civil society was really seen as the driver and the pusher and the, the activist. Um, against what we usually term to be a rather sort of con you know, conservative, but with a small c, not political, uh, government that was not responding to, to the lobbying. That has changed massively, in my view. And I think just looking at the UK, so excuse me for doing that, um, we can see some really important changes that have happened in the UK in these areas that really were led by parliamentarian advocates <coughs> and activists. Uh, people like Lynn Featherstone, who was an MP and then a minister, and she really led the way in many respects on gender equality in marriage, for example. She also really led the way of talking about FGM when other people really weren't in the UK. Um, our Secretary of State, Justin Greening. I mean, one of the things she said, and it's, it must be slightly frustrating for her, because agencies like PLAN who come into lobby and push and advocate, she will often say to us, we're pushing at an open door, you know, we're there, we're actually out there in front. And I think that's quite interesting, and I think um, understanding how parliamentarians in your countries um, see their role as being out there in front and seeing what a sort of, you know, campaigning and lobbying MP looks like, and getting civil society as allies. I think is is really uh, you know the way to go. So civil society has a really important role, but my goodness, so do parliamentarians. And how do we get the best out of each other? And how do we make each other work harder and hold <coughs> each other to account? And I think that's the challenge. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Tanya. <clears throat> and I would like to emphasise that point about having the right sort of parliamentarians in, in place at the right time, because we have certainly had that over the last um, five, five, six years. This all-party group that I chair, way back in 2003, produced a big report and made a big noise about FGM. There were acts of parliament in this country against FGM and against taking people abroad for FGM. There were laws against child marriage, except we still got the 16 with yeah. parental permission, which we're working on. Um, but it wasn't really until we got Justin Green in and then Lynn Fenston that we actually got some movement leading and we saw some movement happen. And they really were absolutely tremendous. And I am not a lover of the Conservative Party or the Coalition. <laughs> That's why I'm an independent Liberal Democrat. But I do pay tribute to them in that area. I think they've been absolutely fantastic. Now, our next speaker is the Honourable Maria Ahmed Didi, who's been a Member of Parliament in Maldives for four terms now, which is pretty impressive, and was the first lady lawyer in the Maldives, which is even more impressive, <laughs> and, <laughs> and was the um, Director of Public Prosecutions from 1998 to 2005. We're really looking forward to hearing what we've got to say. Good afternoon, and thank you, Baroness Tong, for this very kind words. I thank Baroness Wormer and uh, Tanya Baron, Tanya Baron for uh, telling us about the good work that you're doing in UK to enforce marriage and uh, early marriages here and other things. I thank CPA for giving me the opportunity to speak here, although it was quite sudden and I'm not really very prepared as such yeah. because it was quite sudden that I came to know that I have to speak here, but I thought I will not miss this opportunity to speak here because I come from a 100% Muslim country. The Maldives is a 100% Muslim country. Sexual contact outside marriage is taboo. So in that context, when you're talking about uh, uh, marriage and early marriage and uh, uh, forced marriage, there are certain things that we would like to uh, consider that maybe might not be so relevant in your countries. Um, when I was uh, very young, I could remember my mom saying that my neighbor, she got married when she was 12. She had a baby when she was 13. So I thought that was very young, but then when you're small, you think 13 is also quite big. <laughs> I got married at 17. I was never forced into marriage, and I thought I was quite grown up. I, if my neighbor got married at 30, uh, 12 and got a baby at 13, I was quite old enough to get married at 17. And my husband was 18 years old, <laughs> so we both decided we were old enough to get married, and we told our parents, okay, in the beginning they told us that we were young, but still in a country where people wanted to get married early, that was okay. I was a mother at 18. Um, then I grew up. I realized I wanted to do other things. I wanted to study. I wanted to become a lawyer. He, my husband wanted other things as well. So while being married, we both decided that there were other things that we wanted to do, so we split up. I came to England to study with my young boy. He stayed at home and he became, uh, 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 did things that he wanted to do. Not that we were angry or uh, we are not, we are on very good terms even now. So it's a good uh, end to a good relationship, I would say. I'm now remarried to another person, now again married, and I, I'm the mother of another boy and a younger girl. So my eldest is 33. And when I say that, usually people ask me, who, oh, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and please don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to shower. <laughs> <laughs> you can, so I can put you to the map. Anyway, so uh, talking about 
early marriage uh, in a country uh, where we are uh, Muslims and all that, putting an age limit is not an easy task, especially when I think about it in hindsight. Because at the time when our family law was passed in 2000, we had a strong leader, a dictator. And we had two ministers, women ministers, who were strong enough to raise their voice and wanted to keep to the commitments they had given in the Beijing undertaking and also uh, in the CEDAW convention. So without much ado, they put a law into parliament in the year 2000, a family law, which said that uh, the uh, minimum age for getting married was 18. But it said that uh, uh, there was a compromise because even then they started talking about Sharia and that girls should be allowed to marry, marry when they are younger and if there are not many other things would happen and all that. So a compromise was put into the law which said that if a, a judge decided that uh, the girl was old enough to get married, then he could give special permission to do so. But then, you know, we ha I said we have a strong leader, so when the, uh, he was also the head of the judiciary, that's why I say it's a dictator, he was the head of uh, the parliament, the uh, judiciary, and the executive as well. So when the justice ministry passed the regulations, luckily this was good, uh, they put in the regulation that no girl under the age, no child under the age of 18 could get married. They also put into the uh, regulation that you have to attend a seminar uh, organized by uh, the uh, Justice Ministry where they will be told about marriage and married life and uh, social workers and people will come. And that was to be done six to th uh, three weeks uh, before. Uh, the, the date of their marriage. Uh, we have a lot of thalassemia in our country, which is a blood disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, they put into the regulation that you had to be tested for thalassemia. It was mandatory. And if you were thalassemia majors, then you would produce a baby who would uh, very soon die, you know, because he has the blood disease, a sort of a cancer-like thing. So, they were aware of all these things and then what, what all things to do because one in four babies if two uh, thalassemia people get married then it's likely to be a thalassemia major and have these problems. So these things uh, were put into the regulations and the courts also enforced it very strictly. So uh, when we look at hi in hindsight this uh, was a good thing in a way that was done when there was a very strong government. Now, in Maldives, we say, or the Maldives approach to it is we don't have forced marriages. Now, uh, I think even if you, uh, if you took it like that at face value in UK, you would have said that there is no forced marriage. But, but what is force is something that has to be thought about. We've never done a, save, a survey of what's going on, how people are not really forced, forced, like put physical force, but how they are forced in, by circumstances into marriages that they don't really want to go into. Uh, like if you uh, uh, if you have a society where sexual contact between people are taboo, if uh, getting a baby outside marriage is uh, taboo, you have so much stigma attached to the baby as well as the mother, then there are many times where you might have had contact with the person you didn't really want to get married to, but the circumstances have forced yourself to get married to this. So uh, in this sort of context, uh, it is worthwhile at some point for us and uh, as a parliamentarian also to uh, do much research about forced marriages and how circumstances are forced and what we could regard and put into legislation to protect these sort of people who are there. Um, uh, the uh, other thing that happens is when we put uh, such a rigid thing into legislation, as I told you in our country, to have uh, a baby outside marriage is <coughs> taboo the, with stigmas attached to the mothers and the babies. Very often we find that if such a thing happens, 
because of the stigma and the mother not getting the uh, support and all that, they have gone to the extent where they have even murdered the babies to hide from the sh social stigma of uh, not having a baby, of having a baby without a father. These, these things happen in our societies. Um, the other thing is like there are instances where people are waiting to reach the age of 18, but hormones have taken over and <laughs> they have had the, uh, the, this taboo contact and they are pregnant and they want to get married, but they can't. Uh, both intend to get married, both are in love, and they still can't because the law doesn't allow them to. Uh, uh, there are other instances where I have, uh, which I have heard of where uh, the girl, uh, she was two weeks away from uh, being married. They were in a, a room together and they were caught and our law uh, uh, says that it is forbidden. But uh, while the prosecution was taking place, these two have got married and sh the lady got pregnant and just be two weeks before the uh, lady was supposed to deliver, the husband has been sentenced to jail and he is in, uh, uh, suffering from a sentence of 12 years in jail. It's not a suspended sentence or anything, and because we have a very political, polarized environment in our uh, country, and this guy was involved in as a political activist, the child, which uh, was born in uh, legally, because they were married by the time uh, they had the baby, and they uh, they didn't have that sort of sexual relations outside, just contact in the room at all. So the child is going to be denied of a father for the next 12 years. She would see her father only after 12 years. So there are certain things which has to be corrected as well. But it is still very difficult for us to talk about it. Because if we uh, talk about this gentleman's case, uh, because we are also from the party that he is there, they, the, uh, the government party came out and said, that we are trying to protect the child abuser because technically the lady was a child and he was abused under the, uh, he was prosecuted in the child abuse act so it's it's a difficult uh, thing to work as a parliamentarian uh, the other thing that's happening is because our country is now getting it was more liberal before and it's going back to being more fundamental than before so they because the law doesn't allow people to get married before uh, they are 18, I'll finish off now, uh, uh, 18, they conduct uh, uh, special Muslim marriages outside of the system. They get babies outside the system, they don't register them, uh, they don't give them the vaccination that is supposed to be given to them, the children don't get to school because nobody knows that they are there, if they are mostly in outward islands and things like this. So. Uh, though with very good intentions we have come with laws and we have brought these laws with the intention of protecting people, there are still many things to be done. Thank you very much for your attention. Absolutely harrowing story actually. I'm so glad to get my hair it. It's just dreadful. I'm also always very, very intrigued by this notion that no sex is allowed before marriage, you know, and you think, oh yeah, <laughs> Joe, what are they up to then, where are they getting it? And you can never really find out, you can never get an answer, never get an answer. Um, but we can only imagine, can't we, we know what goes on in this country. And this country really has come a long way in about 100 years, I mean it's you think that Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, Victoria, was betrothed at 15 and married just on her 17th birthday um, to a German prince, and they, their first child was the Kaiser who caused the First World War. Um, so no one thought very much of it then. Royalty were marrying teenage girls off all over the place for centuries. And we've had a pretty raw deal, really. I have to say I haven't, and I'm very, 
pleased I was born into the generation I was. But I, I say that because I think in those societies where women are still having a very raw deal, they need to take heart because it's not so long ago that we were actually in the same position. And you do get there, and you get there by education and by family planning. The two great messages, you know, that you must encourage girls to be educated, and you must also make sure they've got access to family planning. Because no empowerment of women can take place unless they've got power over their own bodies. And that means education <coughs> and family planning all the time. Now we've got questions.